suivi pour cette, cet après-midi remarquable. Alors bon, je pense qu'on a subi un petit peu les, les grèves parce qu'on aurait évidemment voulu que, que, que cet amphithéâtre soit, soit, soit plus complet. Mais en tout cas, c'est voilà, un, un plaisir de, de vous revoir en ces, ces premiers jours de printemps. Et surtout, voilà, nous avons l'immense honneur de recevoir aujourd'hui eh bien, Jocelyne Ben Burnell, qui est astrophysicienne à l'Université d'Oxford et chancelière de l'Université de Dundee en, 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 en Écosse. Donc ben voilà, je vous prie de, de, de l'applaudir pour l'accueillir la chaudement. So, uh, dear Justine, so thank you uh, very much for uh, the camera. Is, uh, so I need to, to stay here. Okay. Oui, mais moi, je peux venir Uh, okay, so just in common here. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Sorry, because with the camera, so it's a light online. Uh, dear Justin, so thank you very much for accepting uh, this invitation. It's really an honor for the French Astronomical uh, Society to, to have you with us uh, to this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure that everybody here is uh, really impressed by all your career and all you have done uh, in, your, uh, in your research. You, open, you have opened a lot of uh, field of uh, uh, research and uh, you are a source of inspiration for, for many people. And so uh, today, um, before to start the conference about uh, uh, your big discovery uh, about the Pulsar, um, I would like really to, to, to thank you first and for all the, the, the work that you've done. I would like to uh, uh, Give you a the sorry Johnson Award Prize, and I will uh, give you this. Uh, will open. So I will give you the the medal, the Johnson medal. So that's uh, for you, and, and thank you very much. Yeah, you want to show the medal to the camera, but very handsome. Medal will stay with you for the conference. So uh, I, I will not speak more, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we had a very pleasant day today with you. Uh, There is a new new apple tree uh, in uh, the Juvisy Observatory, so I invite everybody to, to go to the Observatory of Camille Flavarion to, to see the, the new apple tree planted this morning by, by Justin Dalbernel. And uh, yes, yeah, so have a, a good conference. Thank you very much, and, uh, okay. uh, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay. Let me just check that this works. Yes. I understand how it works. Yeah, something is working. Thank you very much. Um, I think that may be not with this. I have a microphone. Oh, I need this as well. I need one of these, please. Yes. That one. Oh. Thank you very much. So, how far can I move? Am I still in camera? Okay. So thank you very much for this wonderful honor. Thank you also for the chance to visit Paris. I am having a magnificent visit in spite of the strikes. So very good, thank you. Very great honor and a very great pleasure to be here. I tend to move around a lot when I talk. 
uh, which I think will not be good for the camera. I will try and remember, but uh, I get excited. So I'm going to say a little bit about my background, a bit then about this story of the discovery of pulsars. But one of the privileges of having discovered pulsars is every so often somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I nearly discovered pulsars, and tells me the story. And those stories too are very interesting. So I will tell some of them. And finally look at what I judge to be the factors that led to the discovery. So I start life in the north of Ireland, Ilan du Nord, and I start by failing my first important examination at age 11. However, next term, we start science. We start with physics, and I come top of the class, having failed an exam four months earlier. Everybody else in that class had passed the exam, but I came top in the science. At age 13, I leave Northern Ireland and I go to school in England, in the north of England, in York. And uh, there I specialise, because in Britain we specialise very early. So by age 16, I am doing mathematics, advanced mathematics, and physics. And then I go to university. I go to Glasgow in Scotland. I do a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of science, which is the standard degree, but I have specialised in physics. In Scotland, it is a four-year degree. In the first two years, you do other subjects. In the last two years, I do just mathematics and physics. I end up being the only woman doing physics for the last two years. And at that time in Glasgow, and maybe still, whenever a woman enters the physics lecture theatre, all the men go and stamp. I can't do that, but you know. All this noise, especially for me entering. And it's important that I do not blush, because if I blush, they make more noise, and it's more embarrassing. The lecturers, the professors, did not join in but they looked as if they wished they could join in. It was very isolated. But I had already decided I wanted to be an astrophysicist, so I have to get a physics degree, and this is my chance. I get my physics degree. I have been interested in astronomy, but mostly astronomy is done at night. And I like my sleep. I need my bed. Oh, I can't be an astronomer. And then I learn about radio astronomy. Astronomy at radio wavelengths, where it works day and night because the sun is not a problem. Okay, I will be a radio astronomer. So I will go to Jodrell Bank. I put in an application. Silence. There was once a woman student at Jodrell Bank. She and one of the men went to the dormitory, dot, 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 dot. The head of the observatory, Sir Bernard Lovell, heard about this mutual encounter and said, no more women. So I can't go to Jodrell Bank. I will never get into Cambridge. I will have to go to Australia, to Sydney, Australia.
but the academic year in Australia starts not in September, October, but in January, February. I have a few months in hand. I put an application into Cambridge, just in case, and very much to my surprise, get a place. So this is maybe not typical Cambridge, but it's one image of Cambridge. At that time in Cambridge, there were very few women, very, very few women. And the position of women in Cambridge was precarious. If the women misbehaved, there was a fear that the men would say, huh, no more women. And that would be the end of women in Cambridge. So we, the women, had to behave very, very well. Cambridge was full of young men who had been to expensive schools, who were full of self-confidence and knew they had a right to be in Cambridge. You have heard of our ex-Prime Minister, Boris? Okay. Cambridge was full of young men like young Boris. And these young men told everybody how clever they were, how brilliant they were, how absolutely right it was that they were in Cambridge, because they were perfect. And I thought, I shouldn't be here. They've made a mistake. They're going to discover their mistake and throw me out. Well, I'm not going to walk out, but they will throw me out. But until they throw me out, I will try my very hardest. I will work very, very hard. I will do my best so that when they throw me out, I know I have done my best and I just was not clever enough for Cambridge. So I'm working very, very hard. So I start in the north of Ireland. This doesn't show very well. I start at number one in the north of Ireland. I go to school in the north of England at number two. I go to university in Glasgow at number three. And then I find myself in the deep south. Now, of course, France is much more democratic. You do not have gradients in France, do you? But we have gradients in Britain like this. I exaggerate a little bit, but there's quite a lot of truth in that statement. And I have come from the heathen country, and I'm now in this civilized place. Not a good recipe. When I arrive in Cambridge, I am given a set of tools. These are not microelectronics tools. These are full-size wire-working tools. I still have them. These are the tools I got given in Cambridge. And it was because I was going to spend a lot of my time building a radio telescope with lots of wire and cables and posts and such. This picture is taken after two years of work. It is near the end of the construction. I have been putting plugs, sockets on the ends of very special low loss cable, air spaced cable, um, very expensive stuff. And we are checking that the connections are good. I have worked through the winter in that little red and white hut behind me, or in the other little red and white hut, which is way down there. The cables could not be coiled up and taken indoors. You have to keep the cables straight. 
so I go to the cables. The cables do not come to me. The whole antenna took about six people two years to build. And uh, it looks like a vineyard or a hop field. There are many, many wooden posts and some wires between the posts. But the posts are the most obvious things. Over a thousand posts. Nearly 200 kilometers of wire and cable. Um, an area of 57 tennis courts. It's big. Uh, and it took six people two years to build it. This is the finished article. Um, you can see many, many wooden posts. They have one job, to keep the wires out of the long, wet grass, because the grass grows quite high, and when it rains, it is wet, and if it touches bare wires, the current goes to earth. So you have to have everything above the grass, above the grass line. Uh, there's a lot of copper. You can see the blue-green of copper. So lots and lots of copper wire. Um, in the years since then, since the telescope stopped using, one night some people came in with clippers, cut off all the copper wire, and took the copper wire away. It's expensive stuff. Um, this telescope operates as an interferometer. Um, we operated it with four beams, so it looked in four directions at any one time. It always looked due south, so as the Earth rotates, it scans, but it does not rotate itself. The only thing that changes is this bit. And uh, transistors were very new at that time. Uh, transistors were noisy. Transistors were unreliable. We use valves, or what the Americans call vacuum tubes. You know, these kind of things. They're quite good. If they're misbehaving, you do. And it reseats the valve in its socket. So it usually solves the problem when you do that. Doesn't work with transistors. Now, what was the science behind this? Well, a few years earlier, radio astronomers had started work and found some very strong radio things up in the sky. Let's say there's one up there. And they say to the optical astronomers, what is there up there? And they look with their telescopes and they say, hmm, looks a bit like a star. But its spectrum is not like a star. Its spectrum does not make sense. In California, two optical astronomers, Martin Schmidt and Jesse Greenstein, you see in the photographs, they each have one, a spectrum of one of these quasars. And they cannot make sense of it. Jesse is writing a paper trying to explain why the spectrum is largely tellurium, why this object is rich in tellurium, because nothing else seems to match the spectrum. Along the corridor, Martin Schmidt is looking at the spectrum of another one, and he says, it looks like hydrogen, but hydrogen with a large redshift, very large redshift. Could it be hydrogen? Jesse, could your spectrum be hydrogen with a large redshift? Oh. Both had large redshifts, but different large redshifts. Now, redshift implies the object is very, very distant, very far away. But it's bright, so it should be nearby. It's bright and it's far away and it looks like a star. 
becomes known as a quasi-stellar radio source, or quasar. And we now know that indeed they are very far away and they are extremely bright. We now know that they have a massive black hole in the centre, uh, which is busy pulling material in, uh, and that they are more like galaxies, whole galaxies, than stars. But these were the first two that had spectra. So, at this stage, a few more of these were found. And by the time I started in Cambridge, there were about 20 of these quasi-stellar radio sources known. And my project was to find more. I actually got the number up from 20 to 200. So that was a much better size of sample. And the technique we used, um, it had already been noted by another woman radio astronomer, Margaret Clark, that the radio sources that they suspected were compact, scintillated, changed in brightness. Whereas the radio sources that were extended gave steady radio signal. So Tony Hewish, my supervisor, reckoned we could find more quasars by looking for radio sources that changed in brightness. And the reason they change in brightness is if the sun, yeah, okay, not show you very well. If the sun is over to the left, the solar wind blows out to the right, and the solar wind is not smooth. There are patches with more electrons and patches with fewer electrons. And this pattern of more and few and more and few means the radio waves get diffracted. And an observer on the ground sees an object that changes in intensity on a fast time scale. Whereas a radio galaxy that we also knew about is actually very extended, don't think this, is, is actually very, very wide. And so you see it through several patches and several gaps between patches and it gives a steady signal. So if we look for radio sources that change their brightness, we are finding quasars. And that's what the project was. It means using high time resolution, which means poor signal to noise. So you need an enormous collecting area to compensate for the short time constant to see the twinkles. So that basically was my thesis. At that time, the University of Cambridge had one computer it occupied a whole room, and it was made with vacuum tubes or valves, not transistors. And very few people could have time on that computer, and we didn't. Our data came out on rolls of paper. 30 meters of paper every day. And I observed for six months. I had five and a half kilometers of paper. And in the picture, I am busy working through some of these paper charts. The idea was to find more of these quasars because they scintillated, twinkled. Um, and I think I've said most of this. I observed for six months. And yes, I found lots of quasars. They formed my PhD thesis. So I got the number of quasars up from 20 to 200, so that was pretty satisfactory. But sometimes in these meters of paper chart, there would be five millimeters of a signal that I did not understand. I quickly got to recognize the quasars, which scintillated, twinkled. I quickly got to recognize radio interference because with a very big, very sensitive radio telescope, you pick up anything that gives radio waves. Pirate radio stations, police car radios, 
badly suppressed cars, because in those days many cars gave radio interference. So there was a lot of interference, but it was random. But I noticed that in amongst all the meters, there was about five millimeters of a signal that I did not understand. Remember, I'm being a perfectionist. I am working very, very hard so that when they throw me out, I will know I've done my best. And this signal was not always there, but when it was there, it came from the same part of the sky, the same right ascension and declination. After I've cited it five or six times, I go to my thesis advisor, Tony, and say, what do you think this is? And he says, you stupid fool. Oh, what have I, what have I missed? You stupid fool. We can't tell what it is because it's all in five millimeters. We need an enlargement. Well, with chart paper technology, enlargement is easy. You run the paper faster under the pen and it all gets enlarged. But if I leave the paper running at that rate, it gets through the whole roll of paper in 20 minutes. And guess who has to live at the observatory, putting a fresh roll of paper in every 20 minutes? No. Next best solution. Graduate student goes out to the observatory shortly before the observation. Can't make the pointer work well just before that object is seen, runs the chart paper faster for five minutes and then switches back to normal. And I did that and uh, after quite a lot of trouble, I finally got it. And this in the upper trace is the signal that came in. The label LGM1 was added later. The lower trace is one second time pips broadcast, which we included. And you can see that the upper trace is pulses, equally spaced, about one and a third seconds. And even where some pulses are missing, you know, it's going da, 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 da. It keeps the beat, it keeps the phase, even if the amplitude drops. And along the bottom are one second time marks, so the period is about one and a third seconds. And the name was added later. That's my supervisor's writing, LGM1. So it can't be radio interference. It is not... Monsieur Francois driving home from work in a badly suppressed car because Monsieur Francois is getting off work four minutes earlier every day, 28 minutes earlier a week, and this has been going on for a month or two. It is not human interference, unless it's other astronomers. So we ask, no, we don't make radio interference. It's not other astronomers. And we puzzle over this. I keep each day observing it. The period does not change. The, that implies that the object is big. It's got big reserves. It does not get tired. But we also know that the object is small because the pulses are quite steep, sharp. They go up and down fast. That means it's small. So it's small and it's big. Aha. So we ruled out interference. We got a colleague, spoke to them very quietly. Robin, Paul, could you help? They have a radio telescope also at 81.5 megahertz. They have their own telescope, their own receiver, their own chart recorder. Could you look at this bit of sky for us? 
see if you see anything unusual. And I remember the day we did that test. Um, my telescope saw the source first. It was pulsing nicely. And then we went and stood by the chart recorder for the other telescope. And nothing happened. Tony and Paul, the two academics, started walking away, talking. What is it could be that produces it in your telescope, but not in mine? Could it? No, it can't be that. What about, no, it can't be that. What about, and I was following along behind. Robin, the other graduate student, stays by his pen recorder. And we've got down this long laboratory, and suddenly there's a shriek. Here it is! We came rushing back up. Robin had miscalculated by five minutes when his telescope would see the source. And it was seeing it. If he had miscalculated by 25 minutes, we would all have gone home. And the story would be different. But it's seen by a separate telescope with a separate receiver. But what is it? It's small because... The period is um, short, and the pulses are short, and it's big because it's not getting tired. Then a colleague managed to get all a dispersion measure. Radio waves come through space. They go past free electrons, and this causes the higher frequencies to travel a little bit faster than the lower frequencies. Um, radio amateurs will know this because if they hear a lightning stroke in the opposite side of the Earth, the signal does not come, <coughs> but comes. <coughs> well, with this thing we're getting, not, <coughs> but. <coughs> so it's come past many electrons. So it's out in space. And we can make a guess at the distance, and it's 200 light years, plus or minus 50. It's way, way out in space. It's not in the solar system. It's beyond that. But it's in our galaxy. Well, we still have this slightly crazy idea about little green men, intelligences signaling to us. And before we can publish, we must sort that one out. Now, if they are little green men, they probably live on a planet which is going round their sun. And when the planet is coming towards you, the pulses get closer. And when it's moving away from you, the pulses get further apart. Little children know this. I'm a small child playing on the floor. What have I got in my hand? It's a racing car. The racing car also shows this kind of Doppler shift. Squeezed up as it comes towards you. Stretched out as it goes away from you. Well, if this is little green men, they will live on a planet. And some of the time the planet is coming towards the Earth. And some of the time the planet is moving away from the Earth. And then it comes back towards the Earth. So, Jocelyn, keep observing, get pulses every day, and we'll measure the period. We found a Doppler shift. But it was due to the motion of the Earth round the sun. The Earth does go round the sun. And because we are on a moving Earth, when we're moving towards the pulses, they pile up. And when we're moving away from the pulses, they stretch out. So we proved that the Earth goes round the sun. But otherwise, not making much progress. Then I found a second one, going at a slightly different rate, one and a quarter seconds, not one, one and a third seconds, and in a totally different part of the sky. 
that's really good. This is not a fault of the equipment. This is a new kind of astronomical object. And indeed, quite soon after that, I found number three and number four. So suddenly, we were free to publish. And we wrote up the paper, and we sent it to the journal called Nature. Uh, one of the advantages of being in a prestigious place, one of the professors phoned the editor of Nature and said, we have a very interesting paper coming to you. Give it your attention, please. Nature published it very, very quickly. And we held a press conference shortly after that was published. And shortly before it was published, my supervisor, Tony, gave a colloquium in Cambridge. So you are Cambridge academics. I am Professor Hewish telling you about this new object. And sitting in the front row is Professor Fred Hoyle. At the end of the colloquium, Fred Hoyle is the first person to speak. Tony's favorite theory was that it was a white dwarf star that's oscillating. And each time it oscillates, it launches a shock into the atmosphere. And it's something to do with those shocks. When he stops talking, Professor Hoyle speaks and says, I don't think it's a white dwarf. I think it's a neutron star. And in 45 minutes, that man had absorbed all the information and hit the right explanation because it turned out to be neutron stars, after all. There was a lot of press interest. It was not always very nice press interest from my point of view. Um, Excuse me a moment, my voice is... The press interviews took a fairly standard form. There would be Tony, my supervisor, and myself. And the journalist would ask Tony about the astrophysical significance of this discovery, which Tony duly told them. And then they turned to me, the young woman, for the human interest. What were my bust, waist, and hip measurements? Would I describe my hair as brunette or blonde? How many boyfriends did I have? That was the gist of all the interview questions that I got. It was really shocking. But there was one journalist who made a useful contribution. Um, he was a journalist from a very conservative newspaper that I don't normally approve of, but he was quite a good scientist. And one of the questions he said is, what are you going to call these things? We had already thought about that. We had two possibilities, pulsating radio stars or pulsed radio stars. And we preferred pulsating because pulsed suggests there's somebody making the pulses, little green men or such. So we said, yeah, pulsating radio star. He said, no, 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 no. A short name like Quasar. What about Pulsar? And as you know, that name has stuck. Pulsars, they became. And that was Anthony Michaelis, who was the science correspondent of a very conservative newspaper, but uh, he was a good scientist. Now, one of the privileges of having been involved in the discovery of pulsars is that every so often somebody comes up to me and says, you know, I nearly discovered pulsars, and tells me the story. And these stories tell us quite a lot about how science works. So if I can take a few more minutes, I will tell you some of these stories. And the first one is way back in 1957. We are at the MacDonald Observatory in Texas. Mr. MacDonald, when he gave money to the observatory, said the observatory must be open for the public one night every month. And it is that open night. 
and the public have come. The telescope is focused on the Crab Nebula, particularly that curious star in the middle of the nebula called Minkowski Star. And people step up to the telescope and say, ah, gee, wow, whatever they said in Texas in 1957. And a young woman steps up to the telescope and says, that star's flashing. And the night assistant talks about how stars twinkle or scintillate and how it is. She says, no, 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 no. But she says, I am an airplane pilot. This is a young woman in 1957. I am an airplane pilot. My job is to fly new airplanes from the factory to the first customer. I fly at night. There's not much to do at night in the cockpit, so I look at the stars. I know about scintillation. That star's flashing. Now, the crab pulsar flashes at 30 hertz, 30 times per second. But some people, a few people, can see 30 hertz. In Canada, the main electricity supply used to be at 30 hertz. And some people, especially young women, could see the flashing. So we think she actually saw the crab pulsar flashing in the optical, which we now know it does. But nobody followed up. The next story concerns quite a much older American man. He was in his 80s at the time that, and this was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, name was Charles Schisler. He had worked for the US military. He had been posted to Alaska, where he was working with the early warning radar, looking for missiles coming from Russia to the USA. And it was pretty quiet. And when it was quiet, his boss allowed him to play around with the equipment. So he used not the radar, but the receiving equipment and looked at the sky. And he found a number of flashing things. At college, he had done an astronomy course. He knew about right ascension and declination and he made the best estimate of the right ascension and declination of those flashing things as he could. And very, very illegally, when he left the military, took that little bit of paper with him. Years later, he has discovered the online pulsar catalog that the Australians have, and several of his pulsing sources including the Crab Nebula, are in that catalogue. And he's so excited. So you can see here a message that he sent to the Australian radio astronomers, describing, I think, what I have just said to you. His supervisors weren't interested. It wasn't important. And he couldn't publish it. It was classified, but he took this little bit of paper away with him. Carefully made notes, proximate location, right ascension, declination. 10 or 11 of, them, 11 of them have been identified as pulsars because he's just discovered the online pulsar catalogue that the Australia Telescope facility holds. Um, one of them was the Crab Nebula. So he's 81, but he's hugely excited. And he came to some of our pulsar conferences Australian radio astronomers worked with him and believe it was genuine. He really did spot some pulsars. Way back in 1967-68. So might have discovered the first pulsar, along with several other people who might have discovered the first. And here's another example, also 1967. It involves a woman called Sue Simpkin, Sue was brought up in Canada. Sue was brought up in Canada at the time that the Canadian mains power supply was at 30 hertz. 
and she knows she can see 30 hertz because as a girl in Canada, she was driven mad by all these lights flashing at 30 hertz. She's been asked by Low Vulture to take a spectrum of that bunny star in the Crab Nebula, Minkowski star. So she does. She takes an ultraviolet spectrum. She says the spectrum's rather boring, but as she's taking the spectrum, she can see sort of waves going out, quite fast waves, like about 30 hertz. Low Vulture says, no, you can't have. But when the crab pulsar was discovered going at 30 hertz, he was man enough to say, you must have been right. So another missed opportunity. For the final one, I am not going to name the people. They are no longer alive. But while they were alive, they were acutely embarrassed by this. And that's why I'm not going to name them. They are radio astronomers. They are making a map of the whole radio sky, surveying the whole radio sky, using big, big radio telescopes. And, you know, they get a week on this radio telescope and 10 days on that radio telescope and another allocation on that one. And they have almost finished the survey of the full sky. There are just one or two gaps that they must fill in. And one morning at early hours, about three o'clock in the morning, one of the observers finds one of the pen recorders, because this is still the age of pen recorders, the pen recorder's going weep, 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 weep. Now, that pen recorder was known to be troublesome. It was sticky. And the way you cure a sticky pen recorder is you thump it. So he thumped this pen recorder, and it stopped going weep, 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 and went back to normal. And he said, oh, good, and put on his coat and went home to bed, as you do at three o'clock in the morning. He did not make an entry in the logbook. There is nothing in the logbook. If he had written something in the logbook, they could have claimed prior discovery of a pulsar. They didn't put anything in the logbook. We've all done it. Um, the pulsar turned out to be 0329 plus 54. The sad thing is that as well as no entry in the logbook, following the discovery of pulsars, they did not go back through their survey data to see if they'd found any others. And that was really because the collaboration had disbanded and you know, one was in that observatory and one in that observatory and another one. They were no longer together as a group. But that was a little sad. I want to finish by mentioning an Italian astronomer, Franco Puccini, who made a remarkable prediction. You've probably observed the Crab Nebula. We now know it contains a pulsar. We know it's the remains of a star that exploded in 1054 AD. So it has exploded about a thousand years ago. Why is the Crab Nebula still so bright? Okay, it would be bright after the explosion, but then it would fade. It's not faded. Why? This was one of the big puzzles in the 1960s. And shortly before the discovery of pulsars, a very eminent Italian theoretical astronomer, Franco Piccidi, wrote a paper that we thought was interesting, but a bit extreme. He says, suppose there is a neutron star, one of those things that nobody's ever seen, in the Crab Nebula. Suppose it contains a magnetic field, which is inclined to the rotation axis. So as the star rotates, this thing cones around. It will give off radio emission at this frequency. If the plasma in the nebula is dense, that radio signal cannot get out, and the energy will be dumped 
in the nebula and keep it shining. He was right on every count. So, how am I for time? Okay, another couple of minutes. Why did the discovery happen there and then? Why not somewhere else, some other place, some other time? Well, we had our own telescope and receivers, and I made sure I understood it, all its foibles, all its quirks, its strengths and its weaknesses. And because I was a graduate student, a research student, I had time, indeed it was my job, to follow up anomalies and things that I did not understand. And I was driven even more so because of the imposter syndrome. This was also one of the first observations in radio astronomy with a short time constant, a short integration time. Previously, they had used integration times of 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And you're not going to see many pulsars if you integrate for long times. And we weren't aware of other observers doing similar work. If you know that next door in the Netherlands, there's a radio telescope doing the same work, the pressure is on you to publish we weren't under great pressure to publish because we didn't think anybody else could be seeing these things. So we could take our time to be careful, to be sure, before we published. Because if we published and it wasn't real, we would be demolished as scientists. We also had a good address if you're going to find something really different, it helps that you belong to a good, reputable establishment. And we did. But increasingly in Britain, you get money for a project. You have to say what the objectives of the project are. And at the end, they see how well you have met those objectives. Never mind if you've discovered something else important. Have you met those objectives? If that had been in place when we were doing this, we might have been in trouble. If we had computerized the search, well, people knew there weren't things, you know, that changed on more than a sort of 24-hour time scale. So why, you know, use high time resolution? And we also had an advantage in that we were working at low radio frequencies, which had been largely ignored, and that we were working with short time constants. So we were in a good area of phase space. Um, but for a long time, that area of phase space was neglected, except by other pulsars astronomers. But now it's getting a lot more attention. So thank you for your interest and your attention. And I hope maybe I've left sufficient time that there can be questions. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Any questions? I, I have one. What was your toughest time in, uh, for a woman uh, scientist? Was it uh, uh, in, uh, in Australia, in UK, in Glasgow, or uh, in General Bank? What, if you have any information about that. There were a lot of times that were tough for a woman. Glasgow was tough because the teasing, harassment by my fellow students. Um, sorry. Glasgow was one tough time. Um, I think actually the toughest times came later. I got married <laughs> and trying to find a job near where my husband worked was difficult. So I moved from radio astronomy to gamma ray astronomy 
to be with my husband. My husband moved, I moved to X-ray astronomy. My husband moved, I moved to infrared and millimeter wave astronomy. My husband left, and I do astronomy at all wavelengths. <laughs> <laughs> well, any, any other? Uh, and one more question. Did you copyright the word pulsar? Did I, sorry? Did you copyright the word pulsar? <laughs> Um, I you have, could make a lot of money on that. <laughs> uh, normally, I think you would not copyright material done with a government grant. Oh. But in fact, Tony Hewish has. He has deposited some of the record um, in a library in Cambridge and copyrighted them. One more question. So it's a double question about the, the discovery. So you, you gave an idea of the distance, the distance of the object. When did you have an estimation of that? And because then you said that you had a five minute delay, I mean, if you compute the time between the two radio telescopes. So it means you had an idea of the direction of the-, the, the can, you, can you speak a little bit more slowly? The oh, okay. acoustics are- Okay. So it means that you, you knew the, the distance between the two radio telescopes. You needed to, to get an idea of the direction of the object in the sky. So how did you make this estimation of the five minutes? I'm sorry, I've not heard enough of that. Okay, feeling. good. Let me start <laughs> again. So um, when you went to the second radio telescope to have a double observation of the pulsar, you said that you estimated the, the time difference between the two observations to be five minutes. Yes. So, so to, to get these five minutes, I guess you should have an idea of the direction in the sky of these objects. And how did you get that? When did you get that from your observation? And, and you said also you gave an, an idea about the, the distance of the object. So when did you get these estimates and how did you get them? Let's see if I can get a picture that will help. Uh, no, I don't have a picture that will help, sorry. Uh, we estimate the distance from the dispersion of the radio wave. Um, we observe with two slightly different frequencies. We guess at the electron density in space and come up with the distance. Um, obviously, it's some rough average, but it shows it's within the galaxy, which was useful to know. Um, so that was one half of your question. Was that? Yes. That's it. Okay. Uh, is there any other question? Yes. Why did you work at uh, 81.5 megahertz? Yeah, 81.5 megahertz was a band that was supposed to be kept clear for radio astronomy. Um, does anybody else remember Radio Caroline? It was on a ship that moored off the coast of the Netherlands. Nice free radio band at 81.5 megahertz. They broadcast until they were shut down. We could not do any radio astronomy. There is international agreement about some bands that are kept clear, which pirate radio stations do not respect. <laughs> and what was the bond width of your receiver? Um, it was one or two megahertz. I cannot now remember something like that because the, the band that's kept free is not much wider than that. Mm. So they give the sensitivity uh, of uh, your receiver? Yeah, bandwidth is one of the things that determines the sensitivity, yes. That's right. I have one, one more question in the public here. Yeah. Still about the frequencies band. Did the 1,420 mega already discovered at this time? I mean the hydrogen line frequency. Sorry, the acoustics in here don't work this way did very the, well. Did the, um, the frequency of the hydrogen line was already discovered at this time? The frequency of the hydrogen line was known, yes. Is and that you're what you're asking? 14, 20 megahertz, 21 yes. centimeters. Yes, it was already known. There were surveys being done at that frequency and around that frequency to map the hydrogen. And indeed, they were beginning to find other molecules as well, because before I went to Cambridge, I worked one summer at Jodrell Bank, um, studying the OH molecule, yeah. which gives a line at 18 centimeters, 
1620 megahertz. Um, I'm not sure there were other molecules known at that point, but they were going to come in quite quickly over the next few years. Okay. Any, any question? So, uh, Sylvain Boulet will say a few words. Just uh, to conclude, so, uh, so thank you very much for uh, this amazing conference. It's, uh, we discover uh, all this, uh, this history because it's, uh, it's just impressed to know, to see how we can do uh, astronomy, radio astronomy at this epoch and all your discoveries. So I would like to thank you again. And uh, we would like uh, that yeah, we can uh, applause uh, a lot uh, uh, Jocelyn Del Bernal. And uh, uh, we hope to, to see you again in Paris one day. So thank you very much. Bon, bah, bonne, bonne fin de week-end.